The death of Princess Louise. During the Edwardian era after Queen Victoria's passing, Princess Louise found herself within the social circle of her brother, the new King Edward VII, who shared her love for smoking. Louise was passionate about physical fitness and she would respond to critics by saying, Never mind, I'll outlive you all. Meanwhile, her husband, the 9th Duke of Argyll, who assumed his position in 1900, took his seat in the House of Lords. In 1900, the Colonel's secretary, Joseph Chamberlain, offered him the role of Governor General of Australia, which he declined. During this time, Louise continued her sculpting and designed a memorial in 1902 to honour Colonel's soldiers who perished in the Boer War. In the same year, she embarked on a nude study of married women upon the suggestion of the English painter Sir William Blake Richmond. Louise spent a significant amount of her time at Kent House and frequently visited Scotland with her husband. Financial constraints were still present even after Lorne became the Duke, leading Louise to refrain from inviting the King to Inverney, Argyll's ancestral home, due to the couple's need for economising. When Queen Victoria had visited the house before Lorne became Duke of Argyll, there were 70 servants and 74 dogs. By the time of Edward VII's reign, there were only four servants and two dogs. The Duke of Argyll's health deteriorated and he became increasingly senile. Louise cared for him diligently from 1911 onwards. In these years, Louise and her husband grew closer than ever before. In spring 1914, Louise stayed at Kensington Palace while her husband remained on the Isle of Wight. Unfortunately, he developed bronchial problems, followed by double pneumonia. Louise was summoned on the 28th of April 1914 and he passed away on the 2nd of May. Following his death, Louise experienced a nervous breakdown and intense loneliness, writing to a friend shortly afterwards. My loneliness without the Duke is quite terrible. I wonder what he does now. In her later years, Louise resided at Kensington Palace, where she occupied rooms next to her sister, Princess Beatrice. She made occasional public appearances with the royal family, such as at the Cenotaph at Whitehall on November 11th, 1925. However, her health declined. In 1935, she greeted her nephew, King George V, and his wife, Queen Mary, at Kensington Town Hall during their Silver Jubilee celebrations and was made an honorary freeman of the borough of Kensington. Her final public appearance occurred in 1937 at the Home Arts and Industries Exhibition. Between these events, her great-nephew, King Edward VIII, abdicated on the 11th of December 1936. In December 1936, Louise wrote to the British Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, expressing sympathy for him during the crisis. Following the accession of Edward's brother, King George VI, Louise's health deteriorated further, confining her to Kensington Palace, fondly referred to as the Auntie Palace by Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret. She suffered from neuritis in her arm, inflammation of the nerves between the ribs, fainting fits and sciatica. During this time, Louise kept herself occupied by drafting prayers, one of which was sent to Neville Chamberlain, reading, Guide our ministers of state and all who are in authority over us. The passing of Princess Louise marked a solemn moment in British royal history, occurring on the quiet morning of the 3rd of December 1939. She had reached a remarkable age of 91, having carried with her the weight of nearly seven decades of life experiences, all while donning the very wedding veil that had adorned her head on her wedding day, nearly 70 years earlier. The circumstances surrounding her final farewell were anything but ordinary, as the tumultuous backdrop of World War II influenced the proceedings. In recognition of the war, a simple funeral service was held in her honour, the shadow of conflict hung heavily over the land, prompting a modest and understated ceremony befitting the times. Despite the challenges and constraints imposed by the global conflict, the solemn occasion was not diminished. As the war raged on, Princess Louise remains underwent a process of cremation at the Golders Green Crematorium on the 8th of December 1939. This decision resonated with the practicality and efficiency called for during wartime, as it minimised the burden on resources and logistics that a traditional burial might have demanded. 
the final resting place of this beloved royal figure was a subject of careful consideration, giving her personal preferences and circumstances. Louise's will contained a clear and poignant directive, specifying that her burial location depended on the place of her death. If she were to pass away in Scotland, her wish was to be laid to rest at the Campbell Mausoleum in Gilman, alongside her cherished husband. However, if fates decreed her end in England, she desired to be reunited with her parents at Frogmore, a place of familial significance. On the 12th of December 1939, Princess Louise's ashes were quietly interred in the royal vault at St George's Chapel. The event drew the presence of numerous members of the British royal family and her own Argyll family, who gathered to pay their respects and bid their final farewells. A few months later, on the 13th of March 1940, Princess Louise's ashes were relocated to the royal burial ground at Frogmore, situated near the regal backdrop of Windsor. This tranquil resting place surrounded by the beauty of nature and the serenity of the royal landscape was a fitting choice for a princess whose life had been defined by an enduring connection to the royal family. The ceremonial duties were carried out with the utmost respect and care, with her coffin being borne by eight non-commissioned officers from her own regiment, the Argyll and Sutherland Highlanders. This tribute acknowledged her long-standing ties to the regiment and added a military touch to the proceedings, reflecting her own deep-rooted connections with the military. In her passing, Princess Louise left an estate that was not only a testament to her lifetime, but also a reflection of the times. Her estate was probated of £239,260, 18 shillings and sixpence, a substantial sum that showcased her financial standing. Remarkably, her debts, a rather insignificant 15 shillings for cigarettes, provided a curious footnote to her financial matters. In total, Princess Louise's passing was a poignant and historical moment, marked by simplicity, respect and a testament to the changing world around her.